Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, session, the fourth in a series of OECD Forum uh, virtual events that have now become co common currency uh, for all of us. We're forgetting what it's like to uh, connect physically, but it's wonderful to be able to uh, do so uh, in this way and in this format, and in particular, bringing people from many parts of the world together that would be nigh, nigh on impossible to do uh, physically in, in, in other circumstances. Um, the for many uh, unprecedented life and death circumstances we're currently living through around the world with COVID uh, call for a significant intensification of dialogue, sharing ideas, expertise, and best practices to deliver the right policies and actions, not just to improve, but to save livelihoods and lives. Today, we focus on one of the most pressing, but perhaps still insufficiently visible issues we face as we seek to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and move towards a recovery. The challenge of communicating on public health and the critical importance of effective vaccination uptake, by no means a given in a climate of high emotion, anxiety, fear, distrust, mis- and disinformation, and what the WHO refers to as an infodemic. To clarify um, a nuance in terminology from the outset, uh, let me just um, dwell on that distinction between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation refers to false or inaccurate information that is communicated regardless of an intention to deceive. Disinformation, on the other hand, refers to false information deliberately and often covertly spread in order to influence public opinion or obscure the truth. Now, these phenomena are not new, but what makes this different is that this is unquestionably a question of life and death. During these past months, we have understandably been fixated on the global race to find a safe and effective COVID vaccine. Yet it is important that we make no mistake about where the finishing line actually is. Developing the vaccine is requiring titanic efforts, but this is only the first hurdle. We must also guarantee its production, distribution, and critically, its uptake. This is why, with the prospect of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines now firmly in view, the communication challenges surrounding its public uptake are increasingly pressing, making today's discussion so important. According to public health experts, up to 70% of the population would need to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. However, as we will hear from our colleagues at the Pew Research Center, the Vaccine Confidence Project and the Wellcome Trust, reaching this number is by no means straightforward. And we now know that the time lag between uh, having a vaccine and being able to begin that process is narrowing uh, uh, rapidly. Over the past few months, mis- and disinformation have contributed to people's concerns around vaccines. It has muddied the waters of evidence-based information, leading to the spread of vaccine hesitancy beyond traditional anti-vax uh, circles. There's a big difference between individuals who are vaccine hesitant, those who are nervous of something so new and unknown, and committed anti-vaxxers who object to vaccination as a concept and may associate it with various conspiracy theories. Today, we must accept that there are large numbers of people who are genuinely concerned and cautious about a potential cure. It's important that we take this seriously rather than disparage or dismiss and engage with the many legitimate questions uh, which continue to be raised about efficacy, side effects and others. Communications is going to be fundamental to policy efficacy, building trust around immunization campaigns and tackling unfounded rumors. But we are aware, as Einstein said, that changing perceptions, breaking mental models can be harder than splitting the atom. Indeed, our actions aren't always shaped by rationality 
and objective validity. So how does evidence interact with our beliefs and value systems? At the OECD, we've been exploring the links between disinformation and evidence provision, most notably since 2016, the famous year of post-truth. This was an issue of great concern for us as an organization which exists to provide evidence-based analysis. That's really all that we do. So without it, you can imagine the existential challenge. At our OECD forum in 2017, we gathered uh, different stakeholders to help us understand new behaviors of information consumption and the impact of online platforms on information provision. We worked to develop a survivor's guide to a post-truth world, the result of a collective intelligence exercise providing insights on how to thrive in a world in which what is viral can overshadow what is true. A key element in this thought process was a certain acceptance and acknowledgement of a number of shortcomings in the way experts such as us were engaging with people, a certain arrogance and failure to engage meaningfully with the, the realities of people's lives, often a failure to really listen, a key lesson that we have sought to learn. We also saw the importance of speaking a language people could understand, avoiding jargon monoxide, but also moving beyond our expert circles, beyond capital cities, acknowledging the geography of discontent, the importance of engaging with people on their own terms on the issues that most affect their lives. As part of our policy agenda, we have underscored the crucial role of education as a key antidote against disinformation. In 2018, our PISA tests added children's ability to evaluate sources as a new measure of global competency. The results showed that fewer than one in 10 students in OECD countries was able to distinguish between fact and opinion. 10%. Digital natives can be digitally naive. Although we cannot inoculate ourselves against disinformation practices permanently, we can develop immunity over time. How? Building resilience through education and making sense of complexity through coordinated transparency and strategic communication. Now, moving to our conversation today, we will explore the root causes of mis- and disinformation, including global trends in vaccine confidence, and the evolution of public trust in science. How we may go about addressing mis- and disinformation through strategic communication approaches, including the role of intermediaries that may help us bridge the gap between the scientific expert community and ordinary citizens. Now, we're going to start with three presentations on public trust in science and the current state of vaccine hesitancy around the world. We will then turn to a panel um, before we enter into a question and answer session. Uh, to share any thoughts or questions, uh, we would ask you to do so uh, in the chat provided here in the event. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can during the Q&A and perhaps subsequently. Before we begin, uh, we would like to launch a, a poll uh, on a question. Have you had direct contact with people that are vaccine hesitant or vaccine averse? Have you had direct contact? with people who are vaccine hesitant or vaccine averse. And the poll is available, is available at the top right of your screen in the discussion panel. And we will be showing the results throughout the event. So stay tuned. I think we're gonna go ahead and launch that poll now. And as you provide your answer to that, let me uh, introduce firstly, Lara Clements, uh, Lara is Head of Audience and Evaluation at the Wellcome Trust. She's currently leading Wellcome's communications campaign on COVID-19, has broad experience in behaviour change and consumer insight, including working on the development of Wellcome's Global Monitor, launched in 2019. Uh, prior to that, she worked in the UK's Department of uh, Health on public uh, health campaigns, including the government's response to the swine flu uh, pandemic. Lara, let's begin with your presentation. What does the world think and feel about vaccines, science and health? Thank you very much, Anthony, um, for that kind introduction. And it's great to be here today um, to talk about um, the Global Monitor survey. Um, as, as we mentioned, um, Welcome Global Monitor is um, was a survey that was conducted in 2018. So, a long time before Corona. 
uh, has hit. So it, was, it, it was a Gallup World Poll survey in 144 countries where we surveyed over 140,000 people. Um, we were really lucky and fortunate to work with um, Professor Larson, who helped us inform our questions that we asked around vaccine safety. So we asked question and vaccine confidence. We asked about safety, effectiveness, um, and whether it was important for children to have vaccinations. We also asked parents if their child had been vaccinated. So. And it's probably worth um, stressing that these questions were asked within a wider 10 minute module survey, which was which covered a wide range of topics to do with science and health. So looking at things about how trusted scientists were, how trusted government was and things like that. So that's just a flavour of what's in the broader data set. Today, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the vaccine findings, um, and I'm really happy to answer uh, further questions on this. So I, I guess I wanted to start by being kind of a a glint of optimism um, in what can sometimes be quite a pessimistic topic. So we found broadly, globally, that confidence was generally very high, particularly in lower income countries, which I'll come on to talk about. But, and people, there was a high level of people agreeing that vaccines were effective. 84% of people globally um, thought that vaccines were effective. Um, but what we did find was that there was quite a lot of variation about how the in agreement about how safe people felt vaccines were so still positive um, more than three quarters of the world agree that vaccines are safe but actually what you can and people who trust doctors and nurses a lot had were very very were most likely to agree that vaccines are safe across all regions but what the map shows on this slide is the kind of level of um, country variation that there was um, in in the data so some of the highest rates were found in countries like Bangladesh, Ethiopia and Rwanda, where there was really strong levels of confidence. So almost all people in those countries were agreeing that vaccines were safe, effective and important for children to, have to be vaccinated. Um, Obviously, I think what we want to talk about today are the countries where people uh, were more likely to disagree that vaccines were safe. So as you'll see from the charts in the bottom corner, um, France tops that list um, with one in three French people thinking vaccines uh, were unsafe and one in five thinking that they weren't effective. Um, other, I, I think there was also 10% of the population disagreeing that vaccines were important for children to have. I think one of the interesting findings um, in the French data is that that was so consistent across demographic groups. Um, and that was one of the things that we, we thought was a notable difference from some of the other countries we've looked at. Um, you'll see on the table that the other there are some other countries that we wanted to pull out. So um, the other countries with the highest level of disagreement rates were Gabon, to Togo, Russia and Switzerland. But I think there are two other countries that I just thought would, might be worth pulling out today. The Ukraine, um, only about half the population there thought the vaccines were effective. And um, we can see that there's a, it, it's in that part of Eastern Europe, there are, there are quite low trust levels of vaccine safety. And also in Japan, only 34% of people agreed that vaccines were safe um, there. When we dug into the data further, what we found was that as countries get richer, the level of confidence seems to drop, particularly around safety. So obviously on this chart, what you can see is that in East, so in the European data shows much are less likely to agree, to strongly agree that vaccines are safe compared to people in lower income regions, so South Asia or Eastern Africa, for example. Um, and one of, the reason, one of the things that we've talked about a lot internally from the back of this data is complacency and whether this suggests that, that in, in countries which don't remember the, the kinds of deadly diseases that some of the other countries recognise that people are, are less likely to strongly agree. So that's just obviously we don't know that from the data, but that's something that we've talked about a lot internally at Welcome. I guess what I wanted to say following this in terms of Despite these concerns about um, safety and e efficacy, there are still high levels of agreement in the data that 92% um, of people agree that it was important for children to have globally, and 92% of parents surveyed worldwide reported that their children had received vaccinations to prevent childhood disease. And even in country, even in regions, for example, in um, Eastern Europe. For example, going back to the Ukraine, even where there are lower levels of agreement that vaccines are safe and effective, 
they're still saying there are higher levels so 80 percent still believe that it's important for children to have and um so i think that for us that sort of um was quite optimistic in the data that looking at when push came to shove people were still choosing to vaccinate their children um even though it's probably it potentially is at lower levels than we would like from a public health perspective and i think that um in the data, the countries which where parents were say that had lower levels, so small levels of parents saying they weren't able to, that they didn't get their children vaccinated, they were still countries with more fragile healthcare systems where access was likely to have been a problem. So I think for me, that's one optimist. It's it, I find our data quite optimistic um, uh, in in this sense. One of the other findings that I just wanted to pull out, um, which I think is worth talking about today, was this belief and um, trust in expertise. So people with more trust in scientists, doctors and nurses tended to be more likely to agree that vaccines are safe. Um, and I think that it's worth thinking about and that there's this overall positive relationship between overall trust in scientists and overall trust in vaccines across all income levels and when we tend to see this most pronounced is in high income countries so you've got 82 percent here of people ag agreeing that vaccines are safe who have high trust in science but this drops to 48 percent of people where they've got that kind of lower trust in scientists the broader findings of the survey look at the range of factors that influence trust in scientists um, and that's things like obviously level of science education, um, levels of tr trust overall in institutions, so levels of trust in government and military and judiciary systems, but it's also, uh, there are also other factors, like how people perceive their own household income has had a strong factor and the levels of income inequality within the country also play quite a big role in kind of how they view um, how they trust scientists. Um, why why do I think this point is important? I think I think there's there's been a lot in recent years of discussion about how people don't believe experts. I think what we can know from the data and is just that some of the most impactful messengers are still those doctors, nurses, and also scientists in the mix. Um, so I think that's where I just wanted to end. Obviously, there's a lot more data available, and if you wanted, um, and including country level breakdowns for 140 countries. So please visit our website for more information, and I'm really happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move to uh, Carrie Funk. Uh, Carrie is the Director of Science and Society Research at the Pew Research Centre, and Pew has been a partner of the OECD Forum for many years, complementing uh, OECD objective data uh, with very, very important uh, um, data regarding um, opinions on key issues uh, of interest uh, in the policy making world. Um, Carrie uh, leads the Centre's efforts to understand the implications of science for society. The Centre studies the social, ethical and policy implications of science for society. The Centre studies the social, ethical and policy implications of scientific developments in areas such as climate and energy emerging issues in genetic and, and specialised in public understanding of science issues for nearly two decades. And you're going to present trends in public confidence in medical scientists and the COVID-19 vaccine. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, as we saw with the Welcome, Welcome Global Monitor data, there are segments of publics around the world who are looking at vaccines with a sceptical eye, and that's what we want to talk about today. Public opinion on vaccines is a kind of special case because so many times we're looking at majorities and we're happy to see those majorities. But in this case, we're looking for the size of the minority because that can have an outsized impact on public health. Um, we're going to focus, uh, you know, there's and there's one other point, which is that, uh, you know, what you're seeing from that data and what you can see elsewhere uh, in public surveys is that one piece of this is how it connects with people's views about vaccines generally, childhood vaccines such as the MMR or just the concept of vaccines. There's another piece that may be specific to a coronavirus vaccine, and both are going to be important. I'm going to talk about the U.S. context today. As you may know, one complication in the U.S. context are our deep political divides, where we're divided into just two, two political camps, and that has come to dominate how Americans see the crisis and everything connected with it. 
going to try to show a slide quickly um, to help you see the numbers I've got in my head right now. Let's see if that will make you slide view. Um, and I use this example as I think it's so telling. Um, Pew Research Center surveys, they're done with representative samples of adults around the, around the country. Um, what you see is that Americans tend to agree um, that the coronavirus outbreak has posed a significant threat to the economy, but there are wide differences between Democrats in the blue line and Republicans in the red line over how much the coronavirus has posed a threat to public health. I find that uh, fundamentally striking because we're so used to seeing policy differences between political groups, but here we see a fundamental difference over what the problems are that we're facing. Um, let me go forward. Um, so I wanna turn to trust. You know, Despite the heartbreaks that we're experiencing, this is also an important moment for science. Science is at the epicenter of the crisis. It's visible to publics around the world in a way that it hasn't been for some time. And how publics are evaluating scientists and their work, I think could have lasting impacts um, over time. So at the center, we've taken an initial look at this question. Here, I'm just going to show you trust or confidence as we call it in medical scientists. We can see the same pattern if we wanna look at scientists more broadly. Um, but what you're seeing here is that Confidence overall in medical scientists to act in the best interest of the public has gone up. Between 2019, which was December 2019, 35% of Americans had this strongest level of trust saying they had a great deal of confidence. That went up to 43% just a few months later as of April. Um, that's surprising, um, but there's a big caveat here. Um, and the caveat is that trust went up among Democrats, but not Republicans. So among these blue bars, what you see is that trust rose from, um, I think, 37% to 53% um, among Democrats, but it stayed exactly the same among Republicans. That's important because uh, we've asked lots of questions at the center about medical scientists, about medical doctors, medical researchers, all sorts of things, but we haven't seen this kind of political divide over any kind of judgment related to the medical community until now. So this is suggesting a new hurdle for trust in the broader community. Um, I'm gonna turn to the question of the day in this context. The question is, will enough people get vaccinated in order to bring these public health benefits from herd immunity? And I think the answer in the US is not quite clear. Um, in May, we asked people, if a coronavirus vaccine were available today, would you get it? So 72% said they definitely or probably would. As of September, that went down to 51%, where about half of Americans said they would get a coronavirus vaccine and half said they would not. That drop of roughly 20 percentage points occurred across the board among both Democrats and Republicans, among all the groups you see here, by gender, by race, ethnicity, age, education. Um, and I, I think one thing we are, we're talking a lot about in the US is the figures here in the second panel for race and ethnicity. You see that among black Americans, the intention to get a coronavirus vaccine went from 54% to 32%. That means that a majority of Black Americans say they definitely or probably would not get vaccinated. That's particularly important because, as you may know, there's been a disproportionate impact of the disease, particularly serious cases of the disease for Black Americans. Um, so it's particularly concerning. It does tie in with other things that we have seen in the Black community about views and beliefs around vaccines and, um, in general, as being a harder to reach public for other kinds of immunization efforts. Now, there's a couple of things I wanna point out. Number one is intention to get a vaccine that doesn't even exist right now is not the same thing as getting it. So we do wanna be cautious about this. I think what I would take away is that these broader patterns are showing us where some of the hurdles are, which, which segments of these publics are most likely going to be harder to reach, what we, need, what we might need to do, pointing us to what we might need to do to reach those segments. Um, and I think the other thing I would take away from these data is a reminder of how quickly public opinion is shifting. This is unusual in public opinion work. We're seeing you know, pretty, pretty wide shifts over short periods of time. 
It, it shows us that people are paying attention to broader discussions around the coronavirus um, disease, how it's being managed, as well as what the development of the vaccine looks like. These surveys were all conducted before the recent announcements from Pfizer and Moderna. Um, you know, I think we may well see more shifts in public opinion, and certainly the center will be out there trying to follow this story. Um, but the, the, the patterns we're seeing over just two surveys, a very short period of time, suggest it'd be wise to prepare for a more skeptical public reaction so that we can be working now to help address those public concerns. And that's why I'm so happy to be here thinking about this together. Let me turn it over to the next. Apologies uh, on muting. Um, thank you very much for those elements. Uh, I think what we're seeing also is the complementarity of the analysis that uh, that is brought um, uh, from Welcome and from from Pew, and we're going to be able to come back and dwell on these and inform our discussion. Um, let me now turn to uh, Heidi Larson. Heidi uh, is an anthropologist and the director of the Vaccine Confidence Project, a WHO center of excellence on addressing vaccine hesitancy, uh, that focuses on monitoring public confidence in immunization programs worldwide. Uh, Heidi is in very high demand. Um, I'm seeing and hearing her on a regular basis. Uh, she um, is, has been involved with the global immunization communication work of UNICEF, chaired Gavi's advocacy uh, task force, and she recently published a book, Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go uh, Away. Really privileged to, to have you, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to see how to get my screen up here. Um, share. Uh, can you see that? My first slide. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, Going to pick up on the slides we, uh, the, what we just heard. Um, as you heard, I run the Vaccine Confidence Project, and, and a quick point is that we've really, in the last decade, have really um, have plenty of evidence that what confidence in the vaccine or the product is very related to confidence in providers, policymakers, systems. We've heard that also just from Carrie and and before. These things are all tied up. Uh, or interrelated, I should say. Um, this, uh, this is a recent study we put out last month just to give you some global mapping of the state of vaccine confidence. This is a Lancet paper looking at all the data we had from 2015 through to 2019. It includes also uh, our key uh, confidence index questions that were used in the welcome monitor, uh, but it goes um, over time. Um, what it shows us is that confidence is, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, volatile, it changes, it's up and down. And I, I mean, I've been involved with vaccines for at, at least two decades now because the previous work with UNICEF that led me to start the Vaccine Confidence Project. And it, 20 years ago, it was not changing at the pace that it is now. Um, we see that some places are getting better, some places getting worse. This is around importance and effectiveness. Safety um, was the, the least uh, improved the least. And in fact, as you can see, the red, orange, yellow uh, are the less least confident. And in places like North Africa uh, and in parts of South America, we see things, people getting less confident about safety. And one of the important things about over time, I mean, the, the, uh, the monitor, for instance, talked about 33% of people disagreeing that vaccines were safe. Some of the media picked up on the monitor saying, oh, it's gotten so much worse. Um, it's the worst in the world. It, it remains the lowest in the world. But actually, because we had the baseline data from 2015, we 
saw that it was actually getting better because in 2015, France, 45 or 41 percent were saying disagreeing that vaccines were safe. 33 started looking good. And what the index is bringing is kind of looking at change over time. And we're trying to anticipate uh, changes in confidence before they cause crises. Um, while um, I ag agree with the, the general sentiment that, that there's more confidence in African countries, it's not as good as it might seem, um, uh, as was one of the slides already from Welcome. Um, there are a number of countries, they're all, there's general, and this is a global thing, generally more confidence in the importance, but when it comes to safety, um, that we saw quite low in, in some countries. So there is, um, this is global, but again, the reasons for it, the, and so much of it has to do with relationships with government, as Carrie said, uh, quite clearly the, the political context, 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 context. <laughs> the country that had the biggest drop in vaccine confidence globally in those five years was Indonesia. And uh, the other one was Philippines. Uh, and everywhere where we saw a drop, we were aware of an incident that happens. So these individual incidents that may seem like if we get through this one, we'll be okay, don't underestimate the longer term knock-on effect of it. Uh, the, and the Lancet Wakefield paper uh, suggesting uh, MMR causing autism in 1998, it was five years before the UK numbers dropped to as low as they did, five years. So these things don't happen overnight. You can't fix them overnight. Uh, so I think that that's going to be important uh, for COVID. And I think the biggest uh, concern I have about the COVID vaccine introduction is we have a, a huge opportunity to get this right. And if we get it right, it's going to be an absolute asset to vaccine confidence moving forward and more broadly. If we get it wrong, we're going to have to live with that across the board for a while. Um, so on the one hand, Indonesia had the biggest drop in confidence because of some resistance from Islam, some Islamic leaders. Um, it started to recover a bit, but it's, there are real issues there. But on the other hand, Indonesia's one of the first that's jumping in, um, securing deals and is talking about uh, the Minister of Finance at a World Bank meeting recently, and I've seen further communication on this, is going to be doing emergency youth author authorization around the Sinovac vaccine, the Chinese vaccine, uh, they say by the end of the year. Um, they were involved with trials, um, and they also were making agreements with the with the UK. They've been, on the one hand, the most proactive, one of the more proactive ones in wanting to get going. I do, I mean, I think it's a country that's going to need um, so, some serious confidence building because they have, uh, and in their enthusiasm to address this, I hope they're, and we're starting more discussions um, with them, as I'm sure a number of people are because of this background of a problem that has, has really lowered their confidence. Again, there's a lot of confusing information out there. Um, on the one hand, Nature writes about researchers questioning the Russian trial. On the other hand, in the same week even, India is buying, securing 100 million doses to start using it. The Guardian talks about the hopefulness, which I fully agree, and this has been really a lot of hope in these last couple of weeks, and I think we all needed a, a boost of optimism. <laughs> um, on the other hand, it's not as as the uh, Wall Street Journal said, um, but you know, not quickly. Um, we also heard about the the Russian vaccine. First, first we heard ninety percent effectiveness for one vaccine, 92% for another, and then 95 almost for some of these uh, from Moderna and Pfizer even went up. On the other hand, we heard Brazil halted their trial of the Chinese vaccine uh, because of a death. Well, the death turned out to be coincidental. So just looking in a few days, the, the, the landscape, and this is what the public is seeing. So 
um, to be fair to the public and their uncertainty, it's a confusing time. It's a hopeful time, but it's a confusing time. And I think as communicators, um, I think one thing that it's gonna be important for us to do is try to ma make some coherent story out of this. Um, try to look at the differences that it's not that there's a million different things going on. There's, it, it's a very confusing landscape right now. Um, uh, but thankfully, uh, we've had a boost of optimism recently, although we're not there yet. We're going to have to manage expectations. Africa has been doing tremendous things uh, at multiple levels, but they ha they've had their own challenges. They've uh, been working, uh, move really into doing involved, engaged in a lot of research. On the other hand, they have protests. Um, uh, in South, this is in South Africa, um, they have real resistance. And I've had calls from some of the trialists down there. They said, you know, we have some of the highest, you know, a, a lot of uh, compliance in our HIV trials even. Uh, and we've done some research, a global research on uh, compliance in pregnancy trials and South Africa was one of the most compliant. But they said COVID is different. There's a whole different sentiment around trials and COVID, which is a, a more resistance one. Jumping to the, the misinformation environment, which is a, our topic here. Um, I follow the global, the World Economic Forum global risk map uh, carefully every year. This is one that particularly stuck with me from 2013. They flagged already digital wildfires in a hyper-connected world, backlash against globalization. And I was, I thought it took a Bit, good bit of courage and appropriateness to say the dangers of human, of hubris on human health, scientific hubris, public health hubris, without that feel like this other stuff going on is not going to affect them. Um, I thought bringing these together was really, they, they nailed it ahead of its time. Some of these issues go way back. Um, some of the things that I was reading in the 2020 report, you know, I, it reminded me in the, some of these in our archive here at the London School, misinformation was even back in the 1800s. This is not a new term. Um, the term infodemics was used way before COVID. Um, this is not something that was invented in the context of COVID. Um, anxieties about vaccinations are not not new. So there is an element of human anxiety that is deep. Uh, it's playing out differently and is, is more um, viral um, in this highly uncertain environment. I wrote a, an article in Nature in 2018. Uh, there was a lot of discussions um, uh, about, you know, there have been a lot of things in the last couple of years about we have to be ready for the next big pandemic. And when they asked me to write a piece, I said, well, I think the biggest pandemic risk is gonna be viral misinformation. And sorry to say that we're in the thick of it. Um, one of the things the Vaccine Confidence Project does is look at the transnational spread and impact of these um, uh, of memes of misinformation. This is, we looked at um, the spread of the uh, Andrew Wakefield or Wakefield Autism and MMR and when they cluster together in a, in a negative context, this is how far they spread. And we only looked for the year, from the year 2016 to 2017. Um, it emanated from the original article in the UK, jumped onto um, media, but it's everywhere. I mean, and this is only in one year, all the different places on social media and online media looking that are mentioning using this Wakefield autism and vaccine link to rationalize some of the negative sentiments and, and reasoning, using it as reasons for vaccine refusal on reasoning, using it as reasons for vaccine refusal. Um, one of the more recent, we also look at the impact of these follows. Um, and I, I'm, I'm particularly, uh, I mean, we're really concerned about the, the jumping continents, jumping countries. This was uh, Dr. Stella Emanuel, who's uh, based in Texas, but a Nigerian. She started, um, 
this uh, she's been very proactive in this America frontline doctors um and it's uh, really neg negative stuff that jumped this is the the spike here in social media is a spike in social media of what she was saying in Texas and this was the social media in Nigeria so we found 10,300 mentions of, of her and the American frontline doctors in Nigerian social media uh, between in that week between the 27th of July and 9th of August. So it, it immediately went there. Be we also have been uh, looking a lot at VK, the Russian kind of equivalent of Facebook, um, and trying to do uh, a mapping of negative positive sentiment. What's interesting to us, um, is these are all Russian speaking, all the dots are, are communities of Russian speakers on VK, VK talking about vaccines. Um, what was particularly fascinating to us is that some of the n more negative sentiments were coming from diaspora populations and pushing negative sentiments back into Russia. It was, we saw less of it going outside, which was kind of you know, we're so used to reading about the Russians embedding and disrupting US and, and even in Europe. Um, but within their own Russian diaspora, there's um, diaspora ones kind of trying to disrupt the local population. Um, in Eastern Europe, we've doing a big uh, multi-country project with UNICEF. Um, there's also uh, images and we've seen similar ones against uh, UK labs coming. Um, this one is about say no to American virus labs. Um, we also, um, uh, I mean, Bill Gates has circulated in anti-vaccine sites before, but with COVID, unfortunately, he's become really a, a huge target, uh, mostly anxieties about uh, or uh, beliefs about motives. What's his, what is his motive? Uh, why is he giving all this money? Is it going to make it money? Or is he planting chips in people to count populations so he can control populations? Well, this may seem crazy, but it's getting a lot of traction. Um, after this one release of this, this is it went out um, in multiple um, places. But what is what really struck me was this was on 13th of June. Within 48 hours, that piece of misinformation that I show you was everywhere you see a dot here. The lightness depends on how many. But that's how quickly, that's how viral, it's more viral than the virus. And this is literally one, 24 hours after um, it went out. Um, the other issue that we're seeing is uh, COVID is a hoax. Uh, it doesn't exist, so why would you want a vaccine? And this is also a, a dominant uh, theme in some of the African countries, and an overall resistance to government control. And those kind of sentiments go back to the, um, um, like in, in Manchester and in, the, in that part of the UK, that's where some of the original 1800s protests, I could show you a graphic looking a bit like this from the 1800s, but it's against government control. Now it's more libertarian resistance in some places like the US and, and Europe. In India, the protests are different because it's really about survival. It's these protests and lockdowns are affecting people's livelihoods and that so the resistance is a different kind. So I get a lot of well, you know, um, so there's a lot of this stuff out there, is it really affecting people? And in collaboration with UN Verified and Purpose, uh, we did a study so we could show the data. We uh, did a, a control trial 8,000 people, 4,000 in the US, 4,000 in the UK. We showed them each side first did overall interviews with all 8,000 on their experience with COVID, different aspects about COVID, including would you take a vaccine, COVID vaccine, if proven safe and effective. Then 1,000 of them saw straightforward scientific fact-based information about what we know with vaccines, 3,000 in the UK, 3,000 in the US saw the five most frequently circulating um, misinformation pieces. What we found before exposure, 
54% uh, of the UK, 4,000 said they would definitely accept a vaccine. In the US, it was only 41.2%. And not to, I mean, uh, Carrie had some slightly different numbers, but um, this was definitely accepted, didn't include the 10 to accept. Um, and then we did the exposure. Um, and what we saw in the UK, there was a 6.4% point drop in people's intention to take a vaccine. Um, in the US, it was a lower drop, it was 2.4%, but it already started at a lower base. So these things do affect people's intentions. Again, as Carrie also said, um, uh, you know, we have to keep re remember that this is um, uh, hypothetical vaccine and not the real thing. So um, uh, it does give us indicative sense, but we'll see when the vaccine is there. Uh, and these are just some of our numbers globally. They're highly varied by country. What's most concerning to me is the, the dark orange and, and kind of gray, which is the more strongly and, and the disagreeing ones, which is particularly acute in DRC, Pakistan, and Nigeria, uh, but um, is also um, in the Europe and Europe and the US are in the more resistant resistant in the Europe and Europe and the US are in the more resistant resistant end. The other point that was made um, was that the percent of the population said they would not take a COVID vaccine. It is now 17% saying they would not take a COVID vaccine. And this was uh, last week. Um, I write about all the reasons behind this in, in, in Stuck. I think a number of you know about it already. Uh, and this is our website. And sorry if I took a bit of time. Tomorrow. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Heidi, for, for that, um, which covers a lot of a lot of elements. I mean, I think uh, we're going to return uh, to some of the elements inside uh, the, the three presentations that we've uh, we've, we've heard. Uh, obviously, you can well imagine from an OECD perspective, uh, the welcome findings showing a, an inverse proportion in, in terms of the, the safety in a sense, uh, the richer a country is, theoretically, uh, richness was uh, equated with development at a certain point in time. I think that that poses real questions about that hypothesis and looking at the situation in Africa um, uh, by comparison, uh, the, the, the stark findings that Carrie, you showed also in terms of volatility, uh, tribalism in a sense from the belief systems perhaps, uh, and then the, the volatility of, uh, of the views um, that, uh, that are at play and also demographic segments in, inside. Um, perhaps there are issues around broader trust because of course people must be behaving also in a, in a manner which is not just focusing on a, a vaccine issue. There are many, many issues at play. And then uh, uh, Heidi bringing in uh, the elements, I think you, uh, you use the word context, 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 and the fact that uh, the issues that we, we're, we're dealing with here are far more viral than the, vir than the virus itself. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to have to uh, broach a little bit later on, uh, is, but for you to ponder that a little bit, is also um, the, 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 the trust in surveying itself, the trust in the polling that you carry out, because of course we know that this is not an easy time uh, for polling, uh, particularly uh, following the US election and, uh, and, and elements around that. So that's maybe something that we can, uh, we can touch upon. But what I want to do uh, now is move into um, uh, a discussion which I think will be informed by uh, some of the elements that we have uh, we have just heard and it, it's super um, to have uh, um, a real uh, range if you like of, of voices with both personal and professional uh, expertise in uh, in this domain um, so we have uh, Melissa Fleming the Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the UN We've got Peter Lees, member for the, of the European Parliament uh, Ethan Lindenberger a pro vaccination activist from the US and, uh, and Heidi, who I have introduced. Now, I'm going to kick off uh, with, uh, with you, Ethan, if I may. Um, now, you're a, a young American. Allow me to describe you young relative to me. Uh, a young American uh, activist known for your opposition to anti-vaccine disinformation campaigns. You were never vaccinated as a kid. Let me repeat that. You, Ethan, yeah. were never vaccinated as a kid. And against your mother's wishes, 
you received vaccinations once you turned 18. In March 2019, you were invited to attend a US Senate hearing that dealt with the spread of diseases that can easily be prevented but are returning because of the dissemination of misleading information on vaccines. And being an advocate um, for immunization has earned you praise from medical professionals and the public health community. But I gather that it's also drawn a certain amount of ire from anti-vaxxers uh, who, and, you, and this has exposed you to a lot of harassment online. Now, you've experienced firsthand what it's like to grow up in an environment in which misleading information can lead people to distrust and even fear scientific knowledge. For the benefit of those of us who haven't been exposed to a strong aversion to vaccination, tell us your story and how challenging it's been to confront your loved ones on a topic mm -hmm. as vital as health. All right, well, thank you. And I know it's a, kind of a weird story to share where most people that grow up in health educated families don't think about the reality that people like myself grow up in families and communities where the given scientific information, the accepted theories and ideas and proven facts and knowledge, you know, my mom didn't believe any of that. And so it's a weird dichotomy where most of the people attending here today probably grew up with educated families probably lived in scenarios where their parents or themselves and their families, you know, their kids, everyone agrees and knows that vaccines are effective. Well, when I was growing up, my mom was telling everyone that vaccines cause autism, they cause brain damage, they were extremely dangerous, and they didn't benefit the health and safety of society in any way. And so we grew up without immunizations and thinking that we were just skipping out on something that was very dangerous. So what's the point of even getting it in the first place? We were never told the importance of vaccines, the preventative public health measures that it gives us. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my late teens, I was educated because I had access to the internet. I was talking to friends. I was going to high school and I was seeing the importance of public school systems trying to get people vaccinated. And that all led to me becoming more educated and doing my own research. Um, had I not done my own research and had I not been as independent as I was, um, or if my mom was more kind of a uh, helicopter parent, I guess you could say, um, and was making sure I was on the same campus she was. Uh, maybe I wouldn't have made the decision I did, but um, growing up, I was told that vaccines were dangerous. My mom said that she did not vaccinate us out of like a safety concern and because she loved us. And it wasn't until later I came to a different conclusion. Um, once I did, though, I was very confrontational with that. And she still to this day does not believe vaccines are effective in any way. Um, she still believes they're very dangerous. And my youngest siblings that are two and five still are not vaccinated. Um, some of my other siblings have received their immunizations because of this discussion going on in my family. Um, but that still goes to show that, you know, I am someone who have traveled the entire world speaking about vaccines. I'm very educated, especially for only being like 20. And my mom still believes that vaccines are very dangerous. It still has not changed her mind at all. And it's sad because when telling my story and talking about this relationship I have with my mother, talking about the information she received and how I came away from that, after all of that and advocating and you know, going to conferences and speaking with the most renowned health officials in the world, she still believes vaccines are very dangerous. Um, so it's a very difficult problem we face. We're trying to educate people like my mom, trying to convince them that vaccines are effective. Um, even you know, for me, you know, as her son, it's still very difficult. I think your, I mean, your example is a powerful one because look, we've, we, we all have lived mother, um, son, daughter relationships, yeah. and it must must have been a very, very hard position and situation to be in. And there's a lot of emotion mixed into that as well, because of course, you know, it's pretty hard to go frontally against uh, um, someone who says that they love you and they're doing something because they love you. And, and, and I, as a parent, certainly can, can uh, re relate to that, having been a, 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 a son at the same time. Um, I'm wondering what what within the, that mixture of emotion um, and hearing what you said about the fact that your mother has not changed her position one iota, what have you been able to learn though from that, that, that experience that would perhaps be applicable with someone else? Um, but perhaps it's an impossible task with, with the mother directly, but, but what, what have you learned from that? And, and also, I heard you say mm -hmm. that you, you were quite confrontational. I wonder whether confrontation is yeah. a solution yeah, in a situation so like that. It's well, it's interesting because you know, I was in my senior year of high school when all of that kind of broke out, and so I was still going to school when I was traveling and speaking and testifying and doing all this stuff. And I was very confrontational with her because I was going to go to university and go to college. And so I told her, like, hey, you know, universities and colleges they need you to have, have your vaccines, and I'm not going to make the, the decision to skip those immunizations. 
um, because that would be my choice at that point as an 18 year old as an adult. And that was the confrontation was just being honest. Um, It wasn't, you know, hey, you're, you're dumb or you're wrong. It, It was very honest, but it was still empathetic. And most people aren't like my mom. Most people are hesitant or they are um, unsure about the safety of vaccines. They're not anti-vaccine the way that she is, or they're not um, explicitly averse to vaccines. Um, She believes in a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, She is um, uneducated in the importance of health and, um, and information gathering. Like she doesn't know how to do really good research. And we see that in the anti-vaccine averse communities, um, good research is not very abundant. A lot of it is um, kind of red herrings and anecdotes and bad information and bad faith arguments. And a lot of that really buys you into this mentality that you are right and that everyone else is wrong. And you believe in these arguments that you can't really combat against. And so I saw when I was talking to my mom, she would pull up videos of these random people online saying, oh, my daughter you know, died the moment she got her MMR shot. And if she looked at me and said, well, you know, tell me how this is not true. And I'd be like, I don't know how, I don't know this lady. And like, I don't know how I can tell you that her story isn't real, but like, I can show you all this research that's validated and um, reviewed by their peers. And I can show you really good information that proves something. Uh, But to her, it didn't make a difference. You know, this is an actual person speaking on it on a camera. And so um, I saw that people like my mom have a very deep ingrained idea of what information is and isn't. Um, And it's a very different view of how the scientific community views good information. So it's almost completely unfair to try and combat that when we're working on two different playing fields. And because of that, I've learned that people like my mom, people that believe these things and have such a um, deep ingrained philosophy of what good information is, and I say that in air quotes, um, because most people aren't like that, it's important to be empathetic and kind to people like my mom that really small minority that are really averse, very anti-vaccine, because they're not the commonality. You know, if we treat them as if they're stupid, if we talk to them as if um, they're this fringe, dismissed group, um, people that are more hesitant will see that. And the people that we might be able to convince can see a dismissive or rude attitude that we treat these these more uh, small minorities, people like my mom that believe these things. Um, It can cause a huge devastating impact on how hesitant people believe in vaccines. Um, like my whole family was very hesitant, but my mom was anti-vaccine. She was, she was averse because I treated her with respect and kindness. And I was still honest. I still told her she was wrong, um, but I was kind. Most of my other family members have gotten their vaccines because they saw that interaction play out between us. And we all know like the harassment going on online and uh, how the anti-vaccine community and the averse community can treat other people in the scientific community. Um, we see a lot of like the, um, you know, online harassment stuff, it can be hard to be kind, but that's why it's so important because, you know, people that are hesitant or unsure will see, oh, one community, one camp is being kind of nasty and saying mean things while the other person is like trying to be above that and they're still holding up good information. Um, and that's the absolutely the, the top biggest thing I've learned in this whole journey. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, let me now turn to you, Melissa. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, Melissa, uh, you uh, have served as the Undersecretary General for Global Communications at the UN since September of 2019. I think that means that you've got the cares of the world on your shoulders every day. It doesn't show too much. Now, before all that, it's not as though you had an easy job. That's when I first met you, I remember, back in 2009. I think you'd just taken on the job as the Head of Global Communications and a spokesperson for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, you've done loads of things in your career, but one of the things that I've, I've picked up on most, perhaps it's one of the things that most of us haven't done, uh, is take a decision to do something quite personal. You wrote a a book entitled A Hope More Powerful Than the Sea, uh, and you're the host of an award-winning podcast, uh, Awake at the Night, which focuses on uh, how uh, health workers, humanitarians, and peacekeepers are racing to protect the most vulnerable populations from the threat of the COVID uh, virus. Now, in May 2020, you announced the launch of Verified, a UN initiative aimed at flooding the digital space with facts amid the COVID-19 crisis. With the help of information volunteers, your aim is to increase the volume and reach of trusted, engaging, and accurate information on the pandemic. Now, all I could say from the perspective of the OECD is, hooray. But my my first question to you is, are facts enough? In a situation like the one we're living, how does an organization like the UN confront the different realities on the ground? And what impact are you seeing? And there are some key lessons that are emerging from uh, this uh, uh, project that you'd like to share with us? 
Oh, thank you so much, uh, Anthony. And I think we need more Ethans um, because I think that's one of one of the uh, kind of approaches that I have learned uh, as a communicator who it communicates about data, um, data that represent human beings. And there's this saying that I always have in the back of my mind that statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. So there's one thing, I mean, there's one challenge and that is um, you know, to create empathy, to get people to care. But what, what the, the additional challenge that we have in the COVID, in, a, in a, the, the uh, you know, global public health crisis that we're in now is not just getting people to care, um, it's getting people to trust. Uh, and when you have uh, different actors who are perhaps more savvy in the social media space than the public institutions, the scientists um, uh, who, who actually you know, have the science, have the data, um, it's very difficult to compete. And what we're finding is that, you know, people are, we're, we're living, you know, the backdrop is an environment of mass fear, um, mass unease, um, worry because of, because of the pandemic. Uh, we have the first global pandemic in the social media age, and we have a media environment that is polluted. Um, and you, you referred to it as, you know, I guess maybe WHO didn't coin it, or maybe it did, but whatever. It is, you know, an infodemic, and the definition is, is pollution. It is, you know, good information circulating with bad information, and then you have the public, who is, you know, massively online, um, seeing first on their social media feeds sometimes. Uh, slickly produced uh, uh, videos like the pandemic or more, more recently, um, there's one in France that's uh, three hours long but has gone viral um, it, with, with incredible production um, qualities um, and presented like a documentary but full of conspiracies, uh, but fit, so very difficult to compete with. So this is the, this is the kind of backdrop and environment um, that we're dealing with, um, and that science itself is changing. We're dealing with a novel virus that, you know, it wasn't clear from the beginning, what exactly is this? What do we do to protect ourselves? And some of that, can, you know, and obviously that communication is changing, um, but some of it then ended up contradicting it. So, you know, the, the advice on masks is case in point. Um, you know, at first it was, you know, only public health officials uh, needed or first responders needed to wear masks. The public need not bother. So when, when WHO and the CDC and that came out and said, yeah, oops, yes, actually you do need to wear a mask, uh, the trust was not uh, as, as high as it should have been. So anyway, so we have all of that. Um, we have um, the phenomenon that everybody is a publisher in the social media age. So you have individuals um, who would have been before social media, maybe fringe and, you know, having an audience of 10 that might be finding what they were saying compelling and interesting. And, you know, they're all of a sudden gaining uh, followers, not just in their own communities, but in communities all over the world. Um, where um, many of these are actually, and I think Heidi in her presentation pointed to this, um, this U.S. doctor, are wearing you know white jackets, um, and so, so we have this polluted landscape, and this is the challenge that we at the UN um, are facing, um, all of our public institutions, and why we've actually teamed um, with Heidi. Uh, in the vaccine confidence project so that we can intelligently understand what we're facing so that we can address it. I'd just like to make a couple more points just to, you know, what we're trying to do. You know, first, I think, you know, what we're seeing is that, again, people are hungry for good information. Um, they're just not, uh, they're not finding it. So there is what First Draft News is calling a kind of data deficit. To be honest, this surprises me. I think that there is lots of data out there. I just think it's like in PDF documents where on page 215 might be the nugget that the, the public needs. And so this is why we've launched um, 
this initiative called Verified, which is to do two things. One is to take that science-based information and to produce it in ways that is social media optimized, that is consumable, um, that is entertaining to engage with, um, but is based on science that has the best public health guidance and also is channeled to those public information gaps or where misinformation is, is dominating um, in languages um, you know, that people understand and, and in, in uh, groups and um, on social media where, where uh, information is traveling. But the second is misinformation literacy. So we're, we're working to, uh, you know, we have a campaign called uh, Pause, uh, Take Care Before You Share, which is based on behavioral science. We are trying to make this uh, a new kind of norm, like don't drink and drive, but a social norm that people have in the back of their heads. Oh, I'm seeing this information. It's making my heart palpitate. <laughs> it's playing on my emotions. What do I do with it? Actually, uh, it might be too good to be true. Um, let me go look at the source. Uh, let me see you know, where it came from and perhaps hesitate before we share. That will go a long way to slowing the spread. But we're also working with the social media platforms. I mean, if the social media platforms did more and they are taking some measures in the vaccine space um, to flag or to suppress um, misinformation. However, um, when we saw the wonderful announcements by Pfizer and Modena these days, what we saw was a uh, huge surge, a huge spike in misinformation about the vaccines traveling on the very platforms that are saying and promising that they're going to suppress this stuff. Um, with new, you know, the Bill Gates was trending. Um, uh, Bill Gates is supposedly going to insert a chip with the vaccine, a micro trip that's going to be traceable and that, you know, all, all the world is then um, going to be controlled. But now we see um, wild new conspiracies that the vaccine is going to alter your DNA. Um, you know, this is done in a way that's quite compelling. And I just want to find, you know, end with what Ethan said. We, we, we need to think of people who are believing these conspiracies, um, you know, as, as Ethan's mother, <laughs> you know, people who we know, who we care about, who are perhaps not, you know, not as able to navigate the, this very confusing space, um, who've been convinced by very compelling actors and who we need to work on. Maybe not those who are, you know, so far down the rabbit hole that they are, you know, probably never going to be convinced. But as Ethan said, let's look at the vaccine hesitant, the people who could go either way and see how we could, can come out with persuadable um, information, how we can use human beings. And, and we're, we're actually giving scientists the tools um, to communicate the vaccine proc process. Um, we are trying to elevate um, you know, people, scientists, um, uh, people who've gone through COVID, uh, people who are um, uh, uh, vaccine champions um, so that uh, people have other, other people to latch on to. Um, who they can trust and who can convince them. So that's those are a few thoughts and points. Um, but we have a long way to go, um, and we need all of you. Uh, we need the polling experts. Uh, we need the behavioral science experts, and we need um, we need young people and parents. And if we're going to um, you know roll out uh, the new very promising COVID nineteen vaccines and ensure that uh, people are actually willing to take them. Enough people are willing to take them so that we can reach what vaccines are meant to do, uh, herd immunity. Thank you. Melissa, well, let me pick up on, on something I said in the introduction to you as well, um, because I, 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 I've kicked off in a way with what I would call the rational question. Uh, and I think that the efforts that you are making, by the way, are admirable. And much of what you say also resonates with uh, uh, with, with what we're uh, seeking uh, to do, but the level at which you're having to, to do it is, of course, uh, it's, it's exponentially greater. And I, the expectation as well, the UN is always in a tough position. 
uh, from from that perspective. Uh, but let me very briefly with you just go back to that 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 the sort of the lessons that you might take from your refugee. Uh, experience, which was a, a long and valuable one, and also the decision to go human, you know, with the story that you told uh, in, a, in a hope more powerful uh, than the sea. Um, here we, we're getting into the realms of empathy, of storytelling, uh, to transform negative narratives and, and how these, but do you think that there's an extrapolation that could be made from that experience uh, into this environment on, I know it's different, but um, what, what would you take from that to and bring, it, bring into this space? Absolutely. I mean, um, if you just look, you know, I woke up this morning or maybe it was yesterday or last night to the news that, you know, 250,000 Americans had died from COVID-19. You know, how do you how do you just get your head around that? I heard the, the news anchors trying to describe it as, you know, these are sons and daughters and fathers and human beings. And and I've seen the New York Times do a you know, very admirable um you know, effort at, you know, taking um, in almost, you know, thousands of uh, mini obituaries with, with, with the image and, and you know, bite-sized uh, descriptions of people's lives and just kind of put together, um, you know, humanizing these deaths. Um, we need to humanize uh, COVID-19, uh, the impact of COVID-19, but also humanize the people who are trying to overcome it um, for, for the greater public good. Um, and these are the, the public health officials. These are the doctors. Um, these are the creators of vaccines, the scientists in the labs. Um, and these are the people who will um, be coming into your communities to help, uh, help you um, convince you to get vaccinated. So the human story is absolutely essential because we know uh, that people just don't feel anything when they hear statistics. They go numb. It's a phenomenon called psychic numbing. But when they hear the stories, um, they, they, they do feel something uh, and they are more willing to learn, to absorb. So um, just, I'll leave you just with one thing that we're doing uh, that we hope is going to, to help. We launched a, um, through our verified initiative, a, a project called Team Halo. You can look it up and, and you can follow um, the scientists that we've identified. So far, we you know we started out with, a, with 10 uh, scientists in labs around the world who are working to develop vaccines. Now, the vaccine has been clouded in kind of dark mystery, and it has names like Operation Warp Speed that is certainly was not very well uh, chosen um, if you want to build trust in a, the safety um, of a vaccine. Uh, these are these are um, scientists who are will, were willing to be trained on TikTok. Um, were willing to um, serve as guides um, into this mysterious world of the lab where vaccines are being developed, and to talk to to audiences on a kind of regular basis and explain what is this process and answer their questions. And so far, it's really taken off, and we're we hope to really scale this initiative so that we might even have thousands of scientists around the world who are um, speaking about this effort and just because you know this is you know in their languages, in their communities, and bringing people in and just being real about the scientists, answering uh, about the science, answering questions, humanizing. So that's just one of the efforts, but of course, a lot more needs to be done. Thank you very much. I, I, they, they, the two words that come into my mind are emotional intelligence in all of this. Um, uh, uh, how much intellectual intelligence dominates in many quarters, uh, quarters in, in many esteemed organizations, I think, including my own, and uh, how um, emotional intelligence needs to sort of come to the fore in a, in a, in a moment of period like this. Now, let me turn uh, now, and I'm really glad that uh, we were able to resolve some communication issues because we uh, I'm delighted that we've got Peter Lisa, uh, uh, who's now with us. Peter is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, you've been so since 1994. Um, but combined with that, you're also a doctor. You uh, got your doctorate in medicine at the Institute of Human Genetics uh, at Bonn uh, University. Um, and I, I find it fascinating, this combination. There are a number of you that I've, I've been able to meet in, in the last few years, but it, that, that relevance of the combination of being a politician on the one hand, perhaps, uh, I'm so sorry to say, among the least trusted uh, professions, and a doctor 
on the other hand, uh, perhaps among the most trusted uh, uh, professions, it puts you in a, in a rather uh, unique uh, position. Um, and uh, you, uh, alongside, I think, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Ireland at the time, took that decision to go back to being a doctor uh, on the front line during this uh, uh, period, which I also think is a very powerful uh, signal sent by someone in, in, uh, in uh, the European Parliament, which is not always universally uh, 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 deemed to be a positive and, uh, and popular as an institution. Um, and how do you bridge the health and policy worlds and politics worlds in this current environment? Yeah, in fact, uh, it was a, an interesting experience many years ago to go from medicine to politics and to become much more unpopular. But I can tell you there are serious, honest guys in politics and in doctors, and there are also black sheep in, in both areas. Uh, I can really witness. Um, yeah, uh, for me, it's very important uh, not only to have my personal experience where in the time of March and April, and I'm also now uh, going to a test center and helping out there only a few hours um, a week, but it's good to have the contact and the feedback of the colleagues and to go native somehow. So that is important. And when, um, for example, we speak about vaccine hesitancy, there is a lot of public debate. There is a, a lot of debate in the, in the World Wide Web and social media. But my colleagues tell me that the, there is a shortage of flu vaccine in Germany now. And there, they see people asking for the vaccine that refuse to have it uh, in the last year and the years before. Even quite convinced um, vaccine hesitant uh, uh, people now ask for the, for the vaccine against the flu. So I, I'm quite optimistic from this um, point of view. Sorry, I cannot switch off the telephone now. I don't know what happened here. Um, so, but I think it's important to work with people to convince them, but also as a politician and a doctor, I think it's very important before we try to convince people that we really get things right. And that means uh, that, that when there is something wrong in the process of approving the vaccine, we should correct this. And I I'm really uh, have to shame name and shame three people. The first one is Vladimir Putin. You know, what he did with his Sputnik project was not uh, helpful to give trust in the process. So you cannot approve a vaccine with less than 100 people tested. And when there's vaccine hesitancy in Russia, I would say in Russia, I would also be hesitant. The second one to blame is Albert Bulla, the CEO of Pfizer. I was really fascinated by the news last week, and I trust the people doing the, the stuff in the ground, especially from BioNTech. I, I know these people, we supported them with German and European money. But I'm quite shocked when I learned that Albert Bula made more than $5 million in selling his shares exactly last week. And the answer I got from Pfizer is, of course, that this selling the stocks was planned before, but I don't have any answer why the press release exactly had to happen last Monday. I can't see this from the study protocol and from other information I have. It could have happened a week before. Uh, I come back to that, uh, but it could also have happened this week. And there's no convincing answer why they did it last Monday. And there is, uh, of course, a legitimate suspicion that somebody wanted to make money. And this discredits all the honest people working, working in the vaccine. And the third one I want to name and shame is Donald Trump, the outgoing president of the United States. He wanted to put pressure on the companies to go faster than it's serious. And they resisted. And here also Pfizer has to be uh, complimented. That was right not to do it before the election. To influence the election in, in this way was, would not have been good. Um, but also, uh, I, I heard uh, some of the speakers saying, of course, we need to put risk in perspective. And of course, there, there will never be zero risk in vaccination. 
But if we see that 250,000 people have been dying in the United States and also many, many people in Europe, um, I think uh, normal people would say, okay, the, the very, very, very low risk of being vaccinated, I would prefer to the high risk of COVID-19, but Donald Trump played the risk down. And that's one of the reasons I'm very happy that we now will have a US president that trusts in science and in, in every kind of science, not only the science that he may like. So that's why I think um, we, we, we will have a good opportunity to convince many people. And in the end, I'm very optimistic. I meet a lot of people that ask me as a doctor, they know me personally, and they say, what do you think about the vaccine? And I tell them all what I know, and I would be vaccinated as soon as possible, as soon as I'm in the order. I know a lot of people that say, oh, I don't want to be the first. So, but that's not a problem because we will have a shortage of vaccine in January, February, and March. And people will see that, that other people are queuing up for the vaccine and they, they don't have the serious side effects that they are afraid of. So I think more and more people will be vaccinated and will be convinced. And the problem will be to choose who is the first and not uh, to choose um, who we need to convince, at least in the first six months of the next year. That, that, you touched on some very interesting issues there, and uh, uh, one of which is the um, how it is you, um, you, you, you best go about achieving your goal. Um, to, to convince someone or to uh, influence their behavior uh, on the basis, obviously, as you said, of, of uh, being sure about the, the evidence and the science. And uh, um, Melissa, you alluded to the fact that uh, uh, unfortunately it was the case that uh, there were a lot of mixed signals uh, regarding what to do, uh, how to do it. And we can all put ourselves in a situation, indeed, personally, perhaps, of frustration, um, despite however much education you have, whatever upbringing you have, Ethan was talking about that earlier, that I think all of us can, uh, can, can feel that legitimately. But there's a notion there, um, which we know also from the past, about uh, the, making something compulsory. And, and there, Peter, you just said, well, in, in a sense, you've, you have, I haven't posed you the question, but you've answered the question, which is not much point in making something compulsory that you're not actually going to be able to give everybody anyway. So, so at that point, you want to be thinking in terms of a different strategy, which may be a more a strategy of, well, you know, as you said, or if I could get it first, um, I would uh, do so, but then you have to obviously have to follow, uh, follow a, an order. And I, I saw, I think that it was the deputy science officer in the United Kingdom who used exactly the same phrase uh, that you did. That may not be uh, uh, innocent among the, the, the doctors and scientific community. Um, I, I wanted just to, to come back on one thing with you. Um, and, um, and I know that this is a very important issue also from a, from a political perspective. Perhaps also from a political preference perspective, picking up on what Carrie was saying from there, from the US and in other places, and that is the notion of freedom and civil liberties, and the degree to which people are comfortable and, and, and uh, willing to see any infringement uh, uh, of that at all. And, and I wonder, you know, in, in the European context, where um, there is indeed a committee on civil liberties at the European Parliament, uh, that term is, is very ingrained in. In, in European discourse. Um, I, I wonder what you think about uh, how you reconcile that, um, that strong uh, political desire for freedom, for civil liberties. I'm not going as far as libertarians, but you know, just generally that people, if you've told them something's compulsory, their reaction to that is not going to be, is not going to be great. How, how, do we, how, how do we manage that um, when we may well know, look, actually, this really is uh, going to be the difference between life and prolonged death or infection, which would impact all of us. Yeah, first of all, if you allow, as you referred also to Melissa's uh, statement on also to Melissa's uh, statement on the scientific advice in the beginning of the pandemic, I was personally suffering from the shortage of masks when I so I, I had to examine people with fever without a mask. Um, and for me, it was clear that a mask would be, be helping. Um, and I think it was not uh, managed good enough by WHO, also by our European CDC and the German CDC, because um, there was not 
the 100% evidence that mask would help, but I asked the, the responsible people, why do I wear a mask when I'm doing the surgery if it's not likely to be protective? And we should have gone mask when I'm doing the surgery if it's not likely to be protective and we should have gone a bit faster in community mask and so on. It's everything perfect and everybody has to be able to learn. On civil liberties, yes, we have a strong civil liberty committee in the parliament, and this is important for all of us. So we are a continent of freedom and of civil liberties, but I am a doctor, and when I talk to my colleagues and when I talk to the nurses that treat COVID-19 patients, this is uh, the most stressing work that you can imagine. I have a good contact to an intensive care medicine that works in the Netherlands, and he told me what happened in the first wave. It is unbearable. Um, we put so much pressure on the, on the healthcare system, and these are also people. I fully agree with, with Melissa and others that we need also to show these human faces. So, and there is a right to live, and there is a right uh, for health. And this needs to be balanced with um, the right uh, in, in other areas. And that's why I think we need to, we need to balance this. There is no um, fundamental right that overrides all the other rights. And that has to be, to be clarified a bit more in this perspective. So, and some people even argue there is a right to celebrate that what was yeah, one of the key issues why we have this second wave in the uh, European Union now. And I think this, is, this was the wrong choice and I don't find a right to celebrate in our uh, European treaties or in any national constitution. Thank you for that. Um, Heidi, let me uh, come to you uh, uh, again. Um, now, pondering it, the COVID vaccine has a universality to it. Now, we know, of course, that there will be different vaccines. There are perhaps different um, uh, emphases, but that they uh, will, broadly speaking, um, be universal within their uh, segments and areas. Um, it's the obverse when we talk about addressing the, this infodemic uh, that is even more viral than the virus. There, one size fits all, forget it. Um, you have so many different contexts. I was fascinated to see the um, images that you showed uh, uh, from Indonesia the religious connections and you know, multiply that everywhere, whether it's at a national level, at a regional level, at a local level, the context that we are uh, uh, operating in. Um, what are the key factors in adapting immunization uh, campaigns to national realities? If you can unmute. I think it's um, basically not even adapting um, them so much as, as designing them locally, co-designing them locally. I mean, I think the most successful things that I've seen um, have been co-created with the communities they're trying to reach and not just coming to them at the 11th hour and making sure you have the right local language, but really the whole approach. Um, I, I think one uh, example that I really, really was impressed with was in Denmark. They had a very serious um, uh, anti-HPV kind of movement going because there were groups of girls that had had reactions similar to Japan and then later Ireland, which were uh, like parapo paraparalysis, kind of shaking, nausea, some ending up in wheelchairs um, that were assessed clinically as being psychosomatic or stress related. Um, but that's not a, people do not take that diagnosis easily. Um, and so there was a lot of resent. Um, and the way they came, overcame some of that was aside from having, you know, 
empathy with the fact that these were real symptoms for the girls. These were not made up. These were very real things. And so it was one to have empathy with the fact that and recognize, because sometimes we're so, so when these kind of things happen, we're so as a public health and particularly immunization community are so concerned about delinking it from the vaccine that they forget to say, we're really sorry that you're, I mean, to, to have some sense of um, empathy. <laughs> um, at any rate, what they ended up doing was bringing in a group, a group of young girls of HPV vaccinating age to sit down with the health authorities to co-design a social media strategy uh, to reach their peers. And because they know where their peers go to, they know what makes them tick and what makes them. And I think the more we can do that, whether it's in kind of black communities or minority communities or uh, other, uh, you know, age groups uh, around certain vaccines, um, you know, I think we need, we need to be sitting down with some of the healthcare professionals now because, you know, we, we sometimes assume that because they're healthcare professionals, of course, they're going to take the vaccine, but we didn't see that with H1N1 and it was a problem. Uh, I mean, a problem from a public health perspective, it was a challenge. So I, I do think that um, we, we need to do more co-creation from a bottom up, obviously with some, you know, there are certain guidelines and principles and procedures that each of these vaccines are gonna have that we need to, that will be more universal, like some of the requirements for cold chain, for logistics, they'll be different across different vaccines that needs to be respected equally globally. But in terms of the actual interaction with the public, I think you'd need to start local. Thank you. Um, I think we, uh, we have a result showed at the beginning. I don't know, colleagues, if we actually have that on a slide. Um, if we do, let's put it up. Um, but I have the privilege of having a little text message telling me what the results are. Uh, so uh, I repeat the question. Have you had direct contact with people that are vaccine hesitant or vaccine averse? And the number of answers that we had that were positive was seven, almost 72%. Mm. And uh, the number who had not had any such contact were just over 28%, 72 to 28, those who have had contact with those who either have a hesitancy or an aversion. And I think that uh, that sample from this uh, community of people uh, here today, I think in a sense that is positive because hopefully the elements that we are uh, deliberating on and discussing will be uh, all the more useful uh, as, a, as a result. Um, now, um, let me uh, turn back to um, uh, you know, Kerry and, uh, and Lauren. Thank you for your uh, uh, patience. Um, we're all aware of the questions that have been raised about polling and public opinion surveys following uh, recent events. How can we be sure that we have a realistic picture of where people stand on the issue of, of vaccinations? Um, and do you think that increased scrutiny on the COVID-19 vaccines will have a positive impact on people's willingness to get vaccinated? Let's, let's maybe go with that first one, that realistic picture. Uh, let, Carrie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, you know, I, one thing that should give you more confidence in the polls is the fact that so many public surveys being done now tend to show similar things. And I, I know it can be confusing, you might think, but the exact numbers are not the same. No, they're not, because it does matter what, what question you ask, but you are generally seeing very similar patterns, certainly within each country from public polls being done there. And you're seeing general patterns from our international surveys. You know, we were fortunate as well to, to complete an international survey just before the outbreak really took hold. Now, as you had mentioned, you know, international surveys, if, if you are talking about a developing economy, um, most of those surveys were done face to face and they're just not possible right now because of the pandemic. But you are still seeing an, an amazing number of public polls um, done by telephone or other methods that are, that are giving us a window into what people think. Surveys like this are capturing these big picture patterns. They not, one thing I say is, you know, there is none of us who looks like the majority individual 
right? We have all these individual differences. You're never capturing that kind of individual nuance, but that consistency across the polls tells you that you're capturing a key element that's the, the kind of core sentiment that you're seeing across these publics. So for example, you're not, you're not concerned in, in, in um, and you do a huge amount of surveying on a huge amount of issues as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a great deal in the United States, and that is interesting because of the specific and particular context in that country. But you're not concerned in this instance, say that you know, you've got the people who you are reaching out to may have a, a certain proclivity because they are the types of person, people who will respond more readily to a survey and, and to being uh, contacted for survey purposes. We uh, concerned, yes, we're always working to make sure that we have the most representative sample possible and to, you know, to do everything that we can to capture people who are what some are sometimes called harder to reach. Um, I would say you mentioned political polling. I will just say that you know our our view is that it's way too early to make a verdict about uh, political polling in the U.S. at this point. Um, but political polling, in terms of capturing people's intention to vote in a polling booth, is very different than general public opinion surveys. There's a number of kind of special issues with that in terms of who you're capturing. Um, particularly in the U.S. system where you're not required to vote, it's a voluntary nature and the, the people who turn out can be so varied as we saw this year. If we have just a half a second, I want to just talk again about trust. We've been talking so much about trust. You know, I want to just mention, you know, how do we think of trust? What is it? You know, I think it boils down to the idea that trust is an expectation for a relationship between two parties, two groups, two individuals, if you want to think of it that way. And where does it come from? You know, one piece is that it's coming from this history of a relationship, past experience, either as an individual or as a group member. And that is influencing, you know, how you see um, what to expect from a group like scientists or government leaders going forward. So just wanted to, to kind of share that perspective. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Laura, maybe, I mean, similarly, um, but I also want to, um, pick up on something which is, and I might bring Heidi in on that as well. Uh, I've been really struck by the figures on Africa um, in terms of, uh, you know, how uh, they uh, have, um, have managed this, uh, this wave and this pandemic. I, I was also really struck by the, uh, the numbers that you showed right at the outset, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, you know, incredibly high levels there of, 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 of sense of safety. Now, it's not as though we're talking about parts of the world that haven't been the subject of, not conspiracy theory now, but actual, um, how can I put it, uh, experimental uh, treatments that uh, um, may have been possible at a certain point in history and would obviously be unconscionable uh, today. Um, I, I wonder um, what you um, think there about, you know, or, or if you, in the same way that you were able to extrapolate a little bit of complacency uh, with, with, although you were careful on it um, in Western Europe, um, your thoughts regarding um, those, those figures in, in other parts of the world where you might sort of have people thinking back to times when they may have been considered to, to be guinea pigs and, uh, and, and would have low levels of trust around uh, some of these uh, uh, initiatives. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'll start and then um, I'll hand over to Heidi. I mean, I guess in terms of I mean, I guess I start by saying, obviously, as but we know that the data that I showed is a snapshot in time. Heidi's presentation showed that brilliantly. And actually, what we need to look at is the trend over time. I mean, I guess what I would say about those three countries that um, I talked about at the beginning, so Rwanda, Bangladesh and Ethiopia, I think certainly... Um, particularly in Bangladesh and Ethi and Rwanda, there has been great work, just, you know, co-created with the community. So I think when Heidi's talking about the context being really important, I think in Rwanda, there was a lot of work with healthcare um, and community workers to make sure that the kind of local engagement around vaccination was really, really good. And I think that's borne out in kind of that public confidence and safety. I mean, I think it's, it's coming back to that point about there's many different factors that influence uptake and beliefs in vaccination and vaccine confidence um, and I think that it, I, what we've seen throughout the global monitor analysis that we've done is just thinking about 
the points that Carrie made about how complicated trust is and how complicated confidence is. And it does link to how confident you are in your healthcare systems and also the government and how willing you are to receive health information from the government. So we do see, we have seen globally that people want to get healthcare information mainly from a healthcare professional rather than from their government. So some countries had quite poor scores in kind of trust in public in government information on health um, and I think that it's that broader ecosystem that you just have to bear in mind the context all the time and I think the thing that I just an additional aside not so much about Africa but I guess one of the just picking up on the conversation earlier is I think this frame around speed uh, I, I can understand why politicians have wanted to use that because they want to show progress and demonstrate it but I think that has caused certainly from the qualitative work that we've seen concerns around safety and that sort of dripping feeding into everything so I think there's also a role of other voices like people like regulators and things like that to come out and show kind of how corners are not being cut in things like regulation and things like that over the coming months but I think I'll just hand over to Heidi because I'm sure she'll have lots more to say on Africa um, than, than we do right now. Well, Africa is complicated, um, and as we um, as we saw on the as I was showing on the map, um, unfortunately, some parts of it are are getting worse. Um, but so much of it, and again, Carrie pointed to this before, how much the context matters, the political tensions, the um, and also that also changes because for instance in india um we had um uh typically in the north the the poor muslim communities in uttar pradesh and and um in in that area have typically had like the worst vaccination rates at times 11 percent in the north and and 90 percent in the south and we had saw a total flip this year with the South having these outbreaks of vaccine refusal. And it was because these were in Muslim communities and under the Modi pro Hindu, Hindu nationalist, very strong sentiment, it has made a lot of the Muslim communities feel very uncomfortable, particularly around vaccination, which is every single person. Um, and then we saw this total switch where um, there was, it was improving a bit in the North and, and a different kind of reaction in the South. And that was not at all the case. And if there's a change in government that changes those sentiments, it will change again. Um, and similarly, I just thought of that as an example, but we see the same in Africa, depending on the geo. And it's also not just within countries, but the geopolitical environment. Why are we stuck um, in, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria for so long with the polio? This was about distrust in, 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 in the globalness of this program and not feel, feeling like someone outside the West was controlling. Um, so there are different dynamics, different trust issues, and um, Trust, um, you know, it is based about expectation. And in a lot of the literature, there's about two, two key components. Trust in the capability or ability, like of your doctor um, or whoever the expectation is from, and trust in the motive. Um, so motive, the intention. So is the doctor giving me a shot because he's going to get an, an extra 10, 10 quid? from the system because he vaccinated me or, and this, this was a real problem in China in the transition from the more communist to a kind of mixed economy uh, where people were starting to have to pay for doctors. There were, there's has been, a, there was an outbreak of killings of GPs by patients who were angered and not satisfied with their doctor and didn't trust the motives. Um, it was quite, quite striking. Um, and it was very much about that relational thing. So capability and, and motive. And, and we see the motive issue coming up quite strongly in all the anti, 
um, the misinformation around Bill Gates. What's his motive anyway? Why would he, he must have some reason he's giving all this money to do all these things. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to pick, pick that up uh, with Peter because you, you uh, were quite uh, forthright in uh, pointing the finger at, uh, at three, uh, three actors. And, um, and I think what was underpinning your doing that was precisely what uh, Heidi has just mentioned, which is the importance of motive uh, in uh, uh, this situation. And if you have um, a, an issue around uh, trust, uh, it's fundamental uh, to be incredibly careful about the behavior uh, that, you, uh, uh, that you have in and around that which, as you said, in the case of the sales of shares, whilst it may well be that something was pre-planned, the, the, the timing on it um, was, of course, uh, um, would lend itself to a lot of, uh, a lot of concern. I mean, equally, I, I can imagine there may be some people of a certain political persuasion who wonder if uh, Pfizer might have been able to make that announcement a week earlier, and they held it uh, back so that it did actually happen after a particular election in the country. And why did they do that? Why didn't they just go ahead and give the information where they where they have it, so it, it cuts different ways. But we, um, I want to ask you, um, you know, you're you're uh, uh, from Germany, so um, let, 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 let's put you in that basket of uh, richer countries. Uh, uh, um, OECD member, founding member. Um, when you see those figures of, of relatively low levels uh, of uh, of trust uh, around the vaccine issue uh, in in some of the the European uh, uh, countries. Uh, what does it, what does that make you think? And also, what do you? I, I, we heard the term complacency from uh, from Lara with with care, but what does that make you um, uh, uh, think uh, from from your vantage point? That dual experience on the political and the medical side. Yeah, first of all, uh, on the first point on the trust. So I don't want to be misunderstood. I work a lot with people in the pharmaceutical industry, and most of them are honest, and they really try to do the best for the patients. Uh, but of course, there's always an auditor, there's always a shareholder, and uh, sometimes there's pressure to do what brings uh, the most money. And that's why politicians need to make clear rules and point fingers when something goes wrong. So it's not that everybody who works with pharmaceutical industries is only looking for money. Many of them are looking for the health and they are really convinced, but they are under a certain pressure. And there are, as I said, in the doctors and in the politicians, there are different type of people. Also in the pharmaceutical industry, honest guys and black sheep. And um, I'm just not uh, having enough information that uh, Albert Bola is an honest guy, because it's good that they didn't manipulate the US election, but they could have done it uh, a few days later. And the protocol, the original protocol, was uh, foreseeing it earlier. There was criticism, but nobody um, urged them, pushed them, binded them to do it last Monday. So that's um, this point. And then on the, the different uh, position in the European Parliament, um, already in the last Parliament, the European Parliament did an action on vaccine hesitancy. We want to work with Commission. And we have a new health program. Um, it's not that we want to take over the responsibility from the member states, but we want to do more and we want to do better. And one of the, um, so we will get 10 times more money for health in the European Union than in the current financial period. We go from half a billion to five billion. And one of the priorities is also to um, fight against vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. So that's something that we are working on it, and it, it's urgently needed. But uh, again, I don't think that that will be the problem of the first six months uh, next year. The challenge will be to decide who will be vaccinated and who will not be vaccinated, even though he would desperately like to be. And also that decision, is it really solid? Is it really on a, on a scientific and ethical fundament will influence the whole process. So that's, I think, the main challenge for the next month that not uh, politicians are vaccinated before risk patients. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the important points for the next months. 
I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, um, this is a, a slightly open, open question, who, whoever wants to take it, and I'm going to go into a few questions now. Um, do, do you think that, that the, the in, in a sense, the, the sort of the, the vaccine becoming a, a, a realistic proposition now? We're, we're really starting to, to hear, um, we've gone from a point where people are saying, oh, it's going to take a long time, it's going to take a very, very long time, to optimistic news with, with caution. Um, do you think that this will have um, a positive impact uh, linked to the uptake question? The more we have that news regarding the vaccine itself, that reality, if you like, do you think that that is likely to reflect itself more positively? Yeah, if I may answer, <laughs> that's definitely the case. I, I think uh, there is, of course, skepticism, there is hesitancy, but the general experience I have, there's a lot of hope and people are desperately waiting for this vaccine because we have a, a huge dilemma, at least in Europe and the US and many other parts of the world. We didn't manage the, this disease um, so that people are dying and to avoid people dying, we need to be very rigid and um, introduce restrictions that we cannot continue for years. And that's why the general perception I have is huge majority desperately wants to have this vaccine. We need to make it sure that it's safe, but uh, we, we, we wouldn't hit the expectations of the majority of our voters when we say, okay, let's, let's wait two, two years to make even more studies that that would not be applauded by the general public, I think. Did anyone else want to come in on that issue? Carrie, do you want to venture in? I know you're always careful at Pew, but can I invite you to tempt you into uh, where you think your numbers might be as we get more news on the, on the vaccine? Um, you're right that we, we like to measure and we try not to predict. Um, but I think, as I said, what we really are seeing is a time of rapid shifts in public opinion. We saw so much change in the first six weeks. We're seeing, um, you know, and, and some degree of stability, but I'm expecting more change going forward. So it's something we'll definitely be keeping our eye on. Okay. Um, I have a, uh, a question here. Is there a link between vaccines? So I've, I've, what I've been weaving in is some of the questions I've been getting from the audience. Um, this one is from Hilda Stevens, Professor of Healthcare Innovation at the University of Brussels. Is there a link between vaccine confidence and governments handling the crisis? For example, some Asian countries that perform very well in avoiding, in avoiding a, a second wave. Uh, is their confidence there higher uh, related to um, a general tendency to follow governmental rules and decisions. You might want to come in on that. Can I make a, a quick comment on that? And then I think others will add. Um, the Pew Research Center did do some surveys, I think primarily in Europe, in the US, Canada, a few other places, um, about kind of how they thought their country handled the coronavirus outbreak. And across so many of these publics, we saw majorities saying their government did pretty well. There, there was an, uh, an exception, and that was the U.S., both within, within the country. Americans um, don't see us as doing as well, and, and certainly uh, from the outside perspective, not as well. But that's a really good sign for so many of these publics. Yeah, I, I do think part of it is kind of, it's somewhere between cultural and political, but I mean, because of the systems of government, but culturally, um, there is more compliance. Um, it, it's mask wearing is also much more normal. Um, it's kind of, it's been socialized in a way that uh, it's not, it's very different there. It's a way of life there much more than here uh, pre-COVID. And also they've been on the, on the front lines of some extremely serious outbreaks. Um, and I think their experience of the impact of these, particularly SARS uh, in more recent history, well, it wasn't that recent, but you know, in if you depends how far you go back with history, but 2003, um, and and some of these influenza outbreaks, um, they've been on the front line of them, and 
um, I think that that history uh, has made them much more um, responsive and conscious. I mean, even like chopsticks now, um, you've got kind of your your wooden ones and then like a different color one that one is for serving and one is for personally eating from a shared. Um, and that's something that got started in one of these, uh, I think it was SARS and just stuck and it's there. So there's, there's a number of different kind of things that have been culturally adapted to um, that uh, I think that is part of, part of it. Okay, we've got um, another question now from Gary Minsavich. He's a senior environmental health advisor at ExxonMobil. I understand the phrase herd immunity may evoke negative connotation for some individuals and communities. Is there perhaps a better phrase that scientists can try to routinely, routinely use such as population immunity or community immunity, has such terminology been explored via surveys? That's an interesting one because uh, uh, Melissa, who's had to leave us, uh, said uh, how unfortunate it was that we were using terms like operation warp speed and things like that, that maybe, you know, you can never do anything that's gonna satisfy everyone. Um, but what about this term herd immunity? Well, community immunity is being used more and more. Um, I, I haven't heard so much population immunity, but um, uh, community immunity is getting some traction, but not. it hasn't gotten as much traction as it should, I think. I, I agree, because I, I see the, I mean, the whole evoking of, you know, herd being treated like animals is, is very deep in some people. And... Um, Oh. Listening, sorry, listening to uh, Heidi uh, the other day, uh, we also know the, the connection between the uh, the bovine manifestations. This was around the smallpox, uh, smallpox vaccination back in uh, the 19th century. But we know that these uh, myths and legends stay with us. There is also the connotation about you know whether if you take a smallpox uh, a smallpox vaccination at that time, uh, you were actually going to end up looking bovine. Which is a bit unfortunate. Carrie, you wanted to come in. Oh yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think um, certainly in the US, we actually tested how many people could recognize uh, the definition of a herd of, of herd immunity. And of course it's not everyone. Um, I mean, we can explain this even without the jargon, right? So that's just a basic principle of communication. There's really no need to use that kind of jargon in broad public communications and it's not necessarily doing us a service. Okay, okay, well, I think- Sorry, the other point, I'm sorry, I forgot this. Um, if we haven't said it, I mean, this is uh, one thing that is so striking about this time is how much science is in the news. You know, we are, I'm, I don't know everything, but we have all learned something about a new disease, about the techniques to prevent and, or mitigate the spread of infectious diseases, about the nature of the process to develop um, a vaccine. And so we also shouldn't underestimate the public's ability to take this information in as I think we are seeing a kind of collective learning going on. Mm. Well, thank you. Look, um, uh, we're up against the clock now, um, but I, uh, and I'm not going to attempt to try and summarize uh, um, everything that you have shared in the, the last hour and a half, because because uh, I wouldn't be able to do it justice, it's too much, but we are going to do that subsequently. However, um, I, I think that um, there has been a super, um, I mean, what, what I'm very happy that we've been able to do also is be able to examine this issue from, uh, from different vantage points. And I do think that that's one of the things that we try and do in the, in the forum context, which is actually put sort of different uh, um, uh, actors together in the manner and way in which they, uh, they approach a subject. And also with a perspective that we might be able to uh, uh, retain that connection and that community as we move forward. There are many initiatives that have uh, been taken uh, already. We've heard about them. The uh, the initiatives that uh, uh, Heidi, you're involved uh, uh, with, uh, uh, convince um, the uh, the ones that were set out by um, uh, Melissa from uh, the United Nations, uh, the the initiatives at the European level that Peter uh, alluded to, and I also think the the ongoing effort made by those who are um, surveying public opinion, because it's almost like we might need, you know, we, we have great uh, uh, information in real time on infections and on deaths, 
uh, perhaps we need uh, real-time information on sentiment to see where things are, are going and how they're fluctuating. Um, and, and maybe that's something that we can uh, discuss and build on uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the provision of something of that nature, because it can also allow us to adjust uh, strategies accordingly uh, in, uh, uh, in different environments. Um, clearly, one of the things that we, uh, that we have to try and do is um, uh, make sense out of complexity. And I think that this afternoon, there's been a good deal of, of that, and I want to thank you uh, for it. Uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, quotes is from uh, uh, Richard uh, Feynman, who says that you don't really understand something, the, the Nobel Prize physicist, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it in simple terms. And this goes to the issue often of how um, people find that uh, very hard very often. And so they use code, they use uh, complexity, um, and perhaps in, 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 in a sense, because we, we, we may not be as sharp as we should be in having that ability uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to explain. Um, Context. Uh, context is key, um, and it is also not something that is uh, set in any sort of stone, and, and things can fluctuate uh, uh, really rather quickly. Um, long term, um, I think we've, we've heard as well, uh, this isn't something that we're going to solve uh, or address in a day, in a month, in a week, uh, in half a year, indeed in a year. This is with us uh, as a challenge over a long uh, period of time. Uh, I also think that um, there's much that we can learn from uh, this experience and this exercise, if you like, in addressing uh, a context where you, you, you need to achieve an overall goal. Um, uh, and in doing so, you are contending with some really difficult factors. But that often goes well beyond the public health domain. Uh, but, but perhaps it takes it to occur in the public health domain for the penny to drop for many people about the, uh, the, the, the difficulties and the risks that exist uh, in this uh, infodemic type environment, whether it's in health uh, or indeed in, uh, in other uh, uh, fields. There's a hunger uh, for information. People don't know um, necessarily where to find it. I wonder if that's, again, something that we might be able to dwell on a little bit more. It's probably part of the DNA of my organization, which is to provide um, the type of info that you can uh, rely on. We don't put anything out. It's got to be pretty rigorous and we try and do everything we do based on evidence. So maybe that's something that we can uh, look to um, uh, explore and at the same time be very, uh, very focused on the fact that um, there's no point in chucking statistics at people um, because uh, if they are going to be psychically numb, um, then we've learned nothing from the last four or five years or indeed well before that. I remember in the Brexit debate, someone shouting out to a an expert, that's your, that's your GDP, not mine. You know, someone using a statistic that didn't really bear any relation to the lived experience of someone. And of course, here in the health uh, domain, um, uh, with uh, what we've heard today about the specificity of, of context, we can uh, uh, well uh, imagine that. So we need to get a lot better at humanizing objective ev evidence and connect, connecting you know, that brain with the heart. It's the sort of the rational and the emotional that really there's, a, there's a, a road to be traveled there uh, where we place greater emphasis on emotional intelligence and perhaps a little bit less on the intellectual without, uh, uh, without uh, undoing it, but maybe one needs to uh, get a little bit uh, ahead of the, um, of the other. Now, we want to capture the collective intelligence uh, resulting from today's exercise, and we'd like to hear your thoughts and comments on today's discussion. Um, the conversation is gonna continue on the forum network, uh, which is our virtual manifestation. You can see the link to the network there. It's our online engagement platform. And we've created a specific space within it in order to, to do this. So do please share your feedback um, on the network or indeed via the email that we've uh, uh, put out uh, here, collectivevaxintelligence at oecd.org. Uh, uh, we're going to be producing um, a, a summary and a distillation of the discussion in the coming days. And also all of the elements that have been provided by our speakers, uh, the materials, we're going to make all of those uh, um, available to everyone as well, because there's much that people have been drawing on. So, you know, really good to be able to find something in one place. And then I think from the OECD vantage point, we'll continue 
to follow this issue very closely as a key element in our response to the COVID recovery. Um, as you know, uh, we gather and convene and compare, and we also identify best practice. And we'll be eager to explore how countries' efforts bringing together government and stakeholder initiatives progress and envisage a uh, follow-up uh, discussion and meeting uh, to take uh, stock early uh, next year. And we hope that you will stay in touch with us and continue uh, to look forward um, to, uh, to working on this issue together. Before I and you go also, I'd like to uh, let you know that we're going to have the sort of the, the other half of the coin of this discussion uh, next week uh, in our for forum virtual event focusing on international cooperation and vaccines on November the 24th. Um, international cooperation between all stakeholders is essential to find and distribute effective treatments and a vaccine for COVID-19. And we're going to be discussing the risk of going alone strategies, vaccine nationalism, stressing the importance of a global approach, the multi-stakeholder approach as well. And, and here, um, many of you are, are involved in these efforts as well. We're going to, delighted that we're going to have Jeremy Farrar, we're going to have uh, uh, Gavi, we're going to have a real star cast uh, with us next week on the 24th, um, and look forward to you joining uh, us on that. And last but not least, if you're interested in all things COVID relative to OECD, take a look at our hub, oecd.org forward slash coronavirus. And last but not least, let me extend a really warm thanks to Carrie, to Lara, to Heidi, to Peter, to Ethan, uh, to Melissa. Um, it's been super to have you and I hope that the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. All the best and see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Right.